But we're also ending our, uh, our series on uh, living free. And today, I want to conclude by talking about staying free. In Galatians 5.1, it says this, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Now, Paul is speaking to the Galatian church when he writes this, and he's obviously addressing Christians, and Paul warns them to keep standing firm and not to be subject again to a yoke of slavery. He says to the to the Galatians, be very careful that you don't go back and you don't lose your freedom. And so, you know, something very interesting happened. The Galatians were trusting in their works of salvation to get free, and then they learn about about salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And they got liberated. And then they wanted to go back to the old way. And that's why Paul says, don't go back into bondage again. How many of you know that just because you got free doesn't mean you're going to stay free? You could go back into bondage. Amen. And so that's what the Lord, uh, that's what the Lord doesn't want for us. He doesn't want us to go back into bondage. He wants us to stay free. In John 8, 36, he says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And that means certainly. And that means most assur- assuredly, unquestionably. It means to be truly free. The Lord wants us to live truly free. Amen? And so, so how do we stay free? And that's what we want to try to uh, talk about this morning, we, we need to first of understand that, you know, living free is not an automatic process. Have you noticed that? Like, you just don't say, Lord, I, I want to be saved. I want to be a Christian. And all of a sudden, man, you're totally free. Don't have any more problems anymore. It's a process, right? Freedom is a process. Like sanctification is a process. You know, you get sanctified when you get saved, but you got to walk that out. Amen? But number two, you need to realize it takes personal discipline as well. I mean, God will do what he, what he does on his part, but how many of you know we have responsibility on our part? And so, you know, in, uh, in 1 Timothy 4, 6, it says, have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Continuous spiritual freedom, it's not automatic. You have to, it takes personal training and discipline to stay free. Are y'all hearing me out there? You don't get, you don't just, you don't just live in spiritual freedom by osmosis, right? There's things that you have to do. So I want to talk about some spiritual disciplines that you have to embrace if you want to live free. Amen. The first one is this. Make reading God's word a daily habit in your life. Now it sounds so basic, but John 8, 31, this is what Jesus said. He was saying to those Jews who had believed him. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free, right? So Jesus says, it's knowing the truth that makes us free, right? And so before we can know God's truth, we have to first continue in his word. That's what he says in verse 31. If you truly my disciples, you're going to continue in my word. And so it's not, listen, continuing in his word means to, to stay in it, to give it place in your life, to remain, to dwell, or to stay in God's word in a state of expectancy. And so it's not just learning one truth that makes you free. It's learning many truths that keeps you free. Amen. It's not just learning God's truth one time. It's learning his truth continuously until it begins to affect the way that you think, the way that you behave, the way that you see yourself and the way that you see others. That's whenever your life starts to get changed. God's word wasn't given simply just to inform us, right? But to transform us. And so to continue in God's word requires the daily discipline of reading God's word. How many of you just, uh, you know, just by deduction know that you can't know God's word without developing the habit of reading God's word? You don't have to read the Bible to go to heaven. You just got to read the Bible if you want to live free. Amen. 
Revelation 1, 3 says, happy is the one who reads this book and happy are those who listen to the words of this prophetic message and obey what's written in this book. Now notice an important key here and in verse 3. You can't just read God's word. You have to obey what's written in it if you want to be free. Come on, I need a better amen right there. And so it's applying God's word in the everyday life that, that is, that is the main discipline that sets you free. For instance, when the Bible tells us not to judge others, are we going to judge others? Go around just being critical and judging others? We have a decision to make. Are we going to be judgmental? Are we going to learn to walk around being loving and being accepting and, and not being a critical, judgmental person? If you want to live free, you got to get off your judgmental high horse. Come on. That's more powerful than you just said amen. You got to get off your judgmental high horse, right? And so listen, when the Bible tells us that blessed are the peacemakers, again, we have a decision to make. Are we going to be the one that goes around starting fights, living with quarrels, always fighting and bickering with people? Or are we going to learn to love people, be kind to people? Are y'all with me out there? Come on. If you want to be free, you can't be a troublemaker. You got to be a peacemaker. Amen. So if you want to stay free, you have to read, learn, obey, and follow the instruction, listen, of God's word. I mean, let me, let me just, I'm about to go to point number two. But listen, the Bible folks, is not the daily advertising. And it's not Oprah Winfrey's best suggestions to live a happy life. The Bible is God's Word. It's God's Word. Are you going to listen to the one who created Oprah Winfrey, or are you going to listen to her? Are y'all with me out there? I'm not picking on Oprah. I mean, I'm sure she's a nice person. She just needs to get saved. Amen. The second spiritual discipline that will help you to stay free is strive to always walk in the spirit. I would venture to say one of the most common reasons we lose our spiritual freedom is the dominant control of our sinful nature. Now, the Apostle Paul understood this daily battle that he had with his sinful nature. And in Romans 7, he says this, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. How many of you say, amen? Can you relate with the apostle Paul? The battle within our sinful nature is real, isn't it? And it keeps you from experiencing spiritual freedom. Galatians 5, 19 says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. My goodness, is that a list. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And listen, anytime we allow our sinful nature to dominate or to control our life. We're going to live in a constant state of bondage and sinful slavery. Amen. It's following our sinful nature that drags us in a sexual immorality and impurity and all this stuff that it was just mentioned. It's our sinful nature. Listen, the only way to overcome your sinful nature is to learn to walk in the spirit. Galatians 5, 16, I say, let the Holy Spirit guide you, guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature desires. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to keep us from doing what our sinful nature craves. How many of you know if you just gave into your sinful nature, we would have a ministry down at Lafayette Parish Correctional Center? And Angola, right? Because there's nothing good in our flesh. Verse 17 says, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. 
Now, so what, what the Galatians is saying here is that the sinful nature keeps us from being free to carry out our good, godly intentions. But the Holy Spirit and our sinful nature are always fighting each other inside of us. And they're always trying to dominate. They're always trying to control. And it's us up to us to decide which one we will allow to rule and reign in our life. And I don't know about you, but that flesh of mine, that dude wants to run my life. What about yours? That's why I don't like to fast, but I need to fast. Amen. Galatians 5.16 says, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. The choice is ours. We can either walk in the flesh or we can walk in the spirit. How many of you know if you walk in the flesh, you're not going to live free? Not spiritually and not physically either. You're not going to live free. But if we will allow the Holy Spirit to guide our lives, the Holy Spirit will bring us out of the imprisonment and the enslavery of our sinful nature, and it'll help us. Amen? Here's the practical application. To stay free, we have to allow the Spirit to lead us in our relationships, in our speech, in our behavior, in our attitudes, in our habits, and in our desires. You know what I've noticed? Some of us, we really allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in one area. We just struggle with another area. But come on, you got to let the Holy Spirit guide you in every area of your lives. Amen? Because it's that one area that's going to be your undoing. So what do we need to do? We need to put to death our sinful nature. That's what Galatians 5, 24 says. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and its desires. How do we know if we're following the Holy Spirit's leading and guide us in our life, in crucifying our flesh. We just examine the fruit in our life. Jesus said we're going to know each other by our fruit, right? So are, are you producing spiritual fruit in your life? Or are you producing fleshly fruit? See, that's a good way to know. Listen, if I can't drive from here to the other end of town without peace in my life, my sinful nature is dominating and controlling my little truck that I'm driving. Come on, are y'all with me out there? Say amen, even if it hurts, right? So here's what, here's what spiritual fruit looks like. Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Have you ever said something and you say, oh, man, that was the flesh? Come on, have you ever got Cajun vernacular ticked off? And you said, that's the flesh. Your flesh, I mean, it passes out, but it don't die sometimes. Come on, it just gets weak. And then just when you don't want it to show up, that's when it shows up, right? But come on, we got to learn how to walk by the Spirit. If we're going to live free. Are y'all with me out here? This is so powerful. You know, you're walking in the spirit when of the fruit, when the fruit of the spirit begins dominating your life. Listen, to stay free, you have to learn how to walk in the spirit. Amen. The third spiritual discipline to help you stay free is you got to choose to walk in mercy and forgiveness. You know, listen, this weekend we had freedom weekend and one of the messages was specifically on this. Now, I want you to follow me here. I think there are more people that lose their spiritual freedom over getting offended with someone than anything else. And the worst part about it is when we get offended, we won't even admit that we're offended. That's the worst part. We'll try to sugarcoat it. I'm not offended. I just don't want to talk to them right now. Well, you know, you're offended. I'm not offended. I'm just hurt by what they said. Well, be careful about hurt, right? I'm not offended. I'm just giving them the cold shoulder and I refuse to be nice to them. These are kind of indications that it's not that you just hurt. You got to be careful. In fact, I'm just telling you, if you want to continue to live in freedom, you have to learn to quickly forgive those that cross you the wrong way. Amen? 
Somebody said, if somebody rubs you the wrong way, turn the cat around. You know. I don't know where that is. It's not my nose. I just. I think it's funny, though. <laughs> Ephesians 4.26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, listen, you can know this principle. And, man, it just takes one. It just takes a perfect storm. And, oh, my Lord, we are off to the races, huh? And so we know that anger comes as a result of being mistreated, hurt, wrong by another person. And we know that if anger, if we don't allow it to be dealt with, it gives the devil an opportunity. Because the problem with anger is it turns into resentment and bitterness, and it will enslave you. You know, 2 Corinthians 2.10 says, When you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit so that Satan will not outsmart us. For we are familiar with his evil schemes. Listen, one of the most powerful things to help you get over when somebody hurts you, offends you, wronged you, is to know that the thing the devil wants you to do is get your feelings hurt and get offended and hold bitterness towards somebody. That's the devil's desire. One of Satan's major schemes and ways to outsmart us is to lure us into the bondage of unforgiveness. So to stay free, we got to learn to be quick to extend mercy towards others and forgive them. Amen? To quickly forgive is important. And the Bible says, don't let the sun go down and give the devil. You know what I found? It's a lot easier to forgive if I forgive right away than if I nurse that thing a while. Because the more I nurse that thing, the stronger it gets. Have y'all noticed that? So listen, the longer you wait to forgive, the harder it is to forgive. Now, how do we forgive? You got to extend mercy. That's how you forgive. By, by extending mercy towards others. And remember, Jesus kind of makes, he helps us to understand this. And he tells us this story in, in um, Matthew 18. And he said, you know, there's this guy, man who was forgiven a million dollars of debt by his master. But then he turned right around and he wouldn't forgive his fellow servant like a $5 debt. And so although the servant was forgiven so much, he had no mercy towards the person that just owed him $5. I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of similar to what Jesus was saying in Matthew 18, 32. Then summoning him, the Lord said to him, the master said to him, you wicked slave, I forgive you all this debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way I had mercy on you? And his Lord was moved with anger and handed him over to the torturers, or one translation says the tormentors, until he should pay all that was owed him. My heavenly father, who? My heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. In verse 31, and his Lord was moved with anger and handed him over to the torturers. That's what happens when we don't forgive. We get tormented. We get tormented mentally. We get tormented emotionally. We get tormented spiritually. I believe when we don't forgive, we become spiritually oppressed like the servant in the story that got thrown in the jail or in the prison. That's, he said, until you learn about mercy and you learn to forgive those who have offended you. In verse 32, he said, the Lord said, you wicked slave, I forgave you all this debt. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow slave? Listen, we are the, we are that first servant that have been forgiven a million dollars worth of debt. What he's talking about is that not only did I forgive you when you got became a Christian, I keep forgiving you over and over again. How many of you could say, you don't, you don't sin anymore. You never have an attitude. You never say something wrong. You, you don't never have a wrong motive. We all do saints. And God extends mercy. That's why we're here today. That's why we can serve him. And he says, now listen, if I'm willing to extend mercy to you, would you do me a favor and extend mercy to people that offend you? That helps me. What about you? If you want to stay free, you got to forgive. You got to extend mercy towards those 
that offend you. And every day there are people that quit going to a church and go across town, start going to another church. You know why? The Lord is moving me. No, you're offended. Right? Oh, I'm just not getting anything anymore. Well, get that, that board out your eye and maybe you'll be able to see something. Come on, are y'all with me out there? And so listen, this is serious stuff, right? The fourth and final spiritual discipline that will help you stay free is learn how to fight your spiritual battles by doing spiritual warfare. Listen, you know, we can't blame the devil on everything, right? I mean, if we choose not to forgive somebody, that's on us, not on, on the devil. We chose to do that. Well, listen, not everything is on us. Some of it is on the devil. Amen. Ephesians 6, 12 says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. There's always demonic opposition trying to keep you from your spiritual freedom. And you know, listen, in certain places, in certain geographical places, you can go to certain places, even in the United States, and you get there and you feel the oppression. If you have a discern, if your discerner is working, you can, you can go to a certain area and you can feel it. Listen, well, I, I've been to Haiti a number of times and there is more demonic oppression in the, in that island of Haiti than anywhere else you'll go. In fact, you've heard me tell the story. We prayed for a little boy that was sick in an orphanage and when we laid hands on him and started praying for him, he started slithering like a snake. His tongue was darting out. I didn't know a human being could even do that. But you know what? They've dedicated that island to Satan. And there's witchcraft and there's voodoo and there's all that stuff that's dominating that place. And listen, there's spiritual battles, whether we realize it or not. And the devil would love it for us to just not believe in it. Then he can oppress us and he can bring us into darkness. But I submit to you that we are in a spiritual battle and we need to rise up as men and women of God and we need to learn how to fight our spiritual battle so we can live in the spiritual freedom that Christ paid such a high price for us to live in. Amen? God has given us spiritual authority to fight our spiritual battles. And that's why he says in 1 Peter 5, stand firm, be strong in your faith. You want to stay spiritually free, fight. In Luke 10, 7 or 10, 19, he said, look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you, right? God has given us spiritual authority. So by faith, through prayer, we need to do spiritual warfare, amen? How do you do that? Jesus gives us the, the, the solution in Matthew 16, 19. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. I love the good news translation. It says, what you pro prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven. What you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. You have spiritual authority. And it, it just, it just boggles my mind that I could spiritually say, I bind up the enemy over Tanya and something happens in the spiritual realm. Amen. Are y'all with me? And that she could pray for me and say, I loose the spirit of God over time and the Holy Spirit comes on me in a greater way. That's what spiritual authority is all about. Amen. Come on, we got to quit being like Borny Fife and can't pull his pistol out of his holster and ain't got a gun, a bullet to shoot. And we need to start operating in our spiritual authority and drive back oppression out of our lives. Amen. Come on. If you believe that, say amen. amen. I don't know about you. I don't know everything about spiritual warfare, but I know that, that I can pray over my family. I can pray over you, the church. That's why we took a moment a while ago to pray over generational curses. You say, oh, I don't know. I know about the spirit of the Lord and the Bible tells me I have authority. Yeah. Amen. And I don't know. I have no clue what's happening in the spirit, but I know what the Bible tells me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I know what the Bible tells me. I behold, I've given you power and authority over all the power of the enemy. Amen. Y'all believe that this morning. So if you're going to live free, you can't just lay down and let the enemy run over. Stand up, man or woman of God, 
and take your place. Amen. Would you do me a favor and stand with me this morning? There's a great story in the book of Acts, in chapter 16. There's a story about Paul and Silas, and, and they were getting attacked, and they were losing their freedom, not just spiritually, but physically. And in fact, they found themselves in a physical prison. But they learned how to fight spiritually. And I love, I, I want to read this while, while the worship team is coming. Acts 16, 22, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with ro- wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure that he didn't escape. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. And suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open. The chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. And he assured the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I love that story. Isn't that a great story? Here's a picture of someone who learned how to stay spiritually and physically free by learning how to do warfare. Would you do me a favor and just, would you just close your eyes with me for just a moment? See, you can't do spiritual warfare until you have the authority of God and you can't have the authority of God until you finally surrender to God. The Bible says you got to be born again. You got to repent of your sins. You got to turn from, from wicked ways. You got to give your life to Jesus. Everyone that's here that's a believer, that's a Christian, every one of us had to do that at some point in time. Maybe you here today and you've never done that. Today might be the day that you need to do that. I want to pray a prayer with you if that's you. If you say, Todd, would you pray for me? I'm ready to give my all to Jesus. I'm ready to surrender to Jesus. We're not going to embarrass you or, or, or do anything to, you know, mess you up. We just want to pray for you. If that's you, would you just lift your hand and say, Todd, pray a special prayer for me. I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to give my life to Christ. Just raise your hand. Just just raise your hand and just hold it up and say, Todd, pray for me. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. Thank you, sir. I see your hand. Anybody else? I Right here. Thank you, sir. I see your hand. Right here, sir. I see your hand. Come on. This is your moment. This is your chance. Right here, ma'am. I see your hand. This is your opportunity. Right over here, sir. I see your hand. Just give. Come on. This is it. Let's pray this prayer today. Let's say, let's pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood so my sins could be forgiven. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to wash me. I'm sorry. I repent. I'm turning to you. I want to live the Christian life. Lord, thank you for accepting me into your family. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. And those of you that raised your hand and you prayed that prayer, it's a big deal, man. Heaven rejoices. There's a card in the pew that said, I made a decision. If you just take a, you know, a minute to fill that out, bring it into the lobby, just hand it to the, to the lady behind the counter there. We have a gift, a Bible. If you need one, just tell them I need a Bible. We want to give you some tools to help you get started on the greatest adventure you'll ever embark on in life. The, the journey with God. Amen. Now listen, the rest of us, come on. It's not just good that we've been set free. We want to live free, right? How do you live free? You got to get your nose in the book. It's God's word. Read God's word. You can, if you continue in my word, you're going to know the truth and the truth will make you free. Amen. Come on, you got to strive to walk in the Spirit. Don't live in the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. I encourage you, look in Galatians 5. Look at the different fruit. And when you find yourself operating in the wrong kind of fruit, choose right there. No, no, no. I'm going to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. And then choose to walk in mercy and forgive. Maybe you need to do that today. Maybe you need to forgive. Could you just close your eyes and just lift your hands towards heaven if you have that liberty, if you have that freedom. 
Come on, whenever you forgive, you quit giving somebody the cold shoulder. You quit snubbing them. When you release somebody from your heart, you can be nice to them. You can be kind to them. The Bible says pray for your enemies. Come on, that stronghold needs to be broken if you're going to be free. And maybe today, come on, maybe you just need to release somebody this morning. Maybe you need to forgive somebody this morning. And one more time, I just want to just want you to join with me. Let's just do a little warfare. First Peter 1.18 says we've been delivered from the feudal ways that we've inherited from our forefathers. That's generational curses. And I want to believe with you that every generational curse is broken off of our life this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare, Lord, that every generational curse is broken off of every family in this church right now. Lord, we put the ax to the root and we say the sins of our forefather are not going to hold us in spiritual bondage any longer. We declare the freedom and the liberty of the Spirit of God. We've been engrafted into the family of God. We're living under a different lineage and we declare that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Thank you, Father, for the freedom of the Spirit of God that is being released in this place right now. Lord, I pray in the mighty and in the strong and matchless, merciful name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody that agreed, shouted and said amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, we'll be up here. If not, you're dismissed. Have a great day and enjoy your lunch. Amen.